This is the meat of the podcast. <laughs> Wait, have you ever have you ever caught your have you ever caught your profile reflection in the mirror? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 This shit feel like I won't ever make it home. Expect up, I got to get off of this road. Mm. Flipped on the gas, I swear to God, I'm in my zone. From St. Petersburg and Brooklyn, this is She's in Russia. I'm Lily. And I am Samit. Samith. Samith. My name's Samiti. All right, Lily. What? <laughs> we got a, an, a special guest today. Who is it? Yeah, we have a very special guest. His name is Mark Bullen. Our first Brit. And, <laughs> <laughs> first of all, that's racist. Secondly, no, it's not. I don't know that he's British. <laughs> Bless the queen. Yeah, we have uh, a special guest, Mark Bullen, who, what should I say about him? He's a former cop. He's written a book called Thief and Law, which is a guide to Russian prison tattoos and Russian-speaking organized crime. And he's going to talk to us about reading the, book. the book title. I sure am. He's, he's a former police officer in the UK. Yes. Bink. Bink. Yeah. Yep. Marky. My name is Mark Bullen. I'm the author of Thief in Law, a guide to Russian prison tattoos and Russian-speaking organized crime gangs. Uh, I was a police officer in the UK for 11 years and I dealt with all different types of Russian criminals and I specialised in gathering information about their tattoos. Uh, I left the police a few years ago and have uh, put together all my work into a book featuring all their different tattoos, what they mean and what the Russian mafia get up to. Why were you particularly interested in tattoos? Was it just something you came across arbitrarily? So uh, I was a student in Russia uh, when I was a youngster in the 90s, so I learnt Russian uh, that way. I uh, went back to the UK and joined the police in 2003 uh, and then just, you know, was a general copper on the streets, a uh, uniformed police officer. Uh, but, and I was very active in the International Police Association. And through them, I got to come to Russia in 2010 and worked with the Russian police for a month in St. Petersburg. And it was while I was here, I noticed that all, everyone the, the Russian cops were dealing with was tattooed. They had these greeny, bluey tattoos on their hands and... Uh, all over their body, and I, I, was, I was saying to the co- Russian cops, you know, what's this all about? And they were really surprised I didn't know anything about it, considering I knew a bit about Russia and I could speak Russian. So they, uh, they started to teach me about it, how all Russian criminals, pretty much all Russian criminals, when they're in prison, tattoo themselves with their, with their criminal CV. And they, they taught me, gave me a couple of books, and uh, I got into it that way. Okay. Um, yeah. So you mentioned like they have this kind of greenish blue hue. Can you talk a little bit about the aesthetic of the prison tattoos and like why they look that way and, and sort of the general characteristics that they might have? Sure. So Russian prison tattoos, as I said, as it says, they're, they're done in prison. Uh, the Rus- Russia has the second largest prison population in the world after the United States. And, and it, it has been that way for, for decades. The reason behind why they tattoo themselves is, is debatable. And that's a, that's a thing perhaps I'll speak about a bit later. But they, they get these tattoos on themselves, in my opinion, to represent themselves and to, to show who they are. Because Russian prisons are dangerous hunting grounds almost, a bit like the US. And uh, the, the tougher you appear, the stronger you are, the less chance of you being uh, physically harmed. So the guys in prison, they tattoo themselves uh, with crimes to show what they've committed. Uh, who they are, they're standing in the criminal underworld, and, uh, and these tattoos are done in, in the prison. Now, obviously, there's no tattoo equipment available, so they're done quite crudely. The machines used are uh, needles, needles attached to things like a motors from a razor, motors from a, a cassette player, and the ink used is it's quite interesting. It's the undersole of your boot, uh, burned with a lighter, mixed with your own urine, uh, filtered through a sheet, and uh, sometimes some ink, if they can get hold of any ink, that's added. And, uh, and that's, that's why they appear this sort of greeny, bluey, quite crude colouring. Have you ever seen somebody give one of those tattoos? Like, oh, no, no. That, they're only done in prison. So, um, and I've never seen anyone uh, give them. But speaking to you know, quite a number of guys who've got them, they, they've told me how they're done, what, they, what the ritual is, how the payment is. And, and uh, they've described to me how they do it. 
so so you, they're paying to have them done like are there dedicated tattoo artists or are is anybody potentially able to do these tattoos there are i mean it seems like a skill oh yeah there are dedicated guys in the prisons who do it and if you are one of these guys you can have quite a decent life in prison because you'll, you'll earn payments uh you say that they don't actually pay for them it's it's all agreed between themselves if you're if you're friends with this tattooist or the guy who can do it or uh, if you're a senior guy, perhaps you won't pay. Perhaps you'll just give him a few cigarettes. You know, if you're not, if you're a younger guy, then yeah, you'll pay. You know, it's, it's a barter system. You, you, it's all agreed with within the prison. If the guy's your cellmate, he'll do it cheap. If he's not, then maybe you'll pay a bit more. Hmm. Um, okay, I wanted to like step back out a little bit and talk about from the book. Like you give a whole history of the as the book title says Thief in Law, mm-hmm. which also sort of includes a history of Russian prison system and Russian prisoners. Could you just define like what Vor Zakonia, what that is, Thief in Law? Yeah, so Vor Zakonia, the thieves in law, that, that's uh, what the Russian mafia actually are. That's what they call themselves. So you can take it back from uh, between the revolution and sort of Stalin's time. Russia had always had lots of organized crime in the Tsarist times. There'd been a big problem. The Bolsheviks took over and they went out to crush organised crime, to crush petty crime, and they rounded all these guys up, locked them up. So the gulags that you all know about, they, they were born, and opposition to the Soviets was sent to the gulags. That included a lot of criminals, a lot of organised criminals. Whilst inside, this opposition to the, to the Soviet last Soviet power grew, and the, vord, the vorders, the thieves, uh, emerged from that, really. And it became, it, and tattooing yourself and... But identifying with the the Zakonia became a, a way to oppose uh, the new Soviet Union, the new Soviet government. What was like the heyday when there was a um, a sort of unified force of organized crime and mafia, where with all of the the rules, like that, when that was all cohesive, and then like how did that relate to tattoos? Okay, so so it all starts sort of in the twenties, emerges quite organically from there. And you tattooed yourself, initially quite crudely. I mean, there'd always been tattooing in Russia. In my opinion, it emerged uh, from, from the British sailors. That's where tattooing in the modern world started. British sailors going all over the world, bringing it back to Europe. And men of the sea, criminals, uh, people in the underworld started to, to, to tattoo themselves. That spread to Russia after there was a war between Britain and uh, Russia at sea. It wasn't massive in, in Russia, there, were, there was branding of uh, criminals in Tsarist times. If you escaped from prison, you could be branded on your face. Three letters, cat, uh, I can't remember what it stands for, but that was across the face that showed you were a prisoner mm-hmm. and that you'd escaped. Um, so branding was, was here. But as I say, it started in the 20s, sort of grew to show that you were anti-Soviet, to show that you were a, a real criminal, that you weren't bowing to the Soviets. Uh, but it's real heyday started in the Second World War. So Second World War starts, Germans invade, Russia hasn't got enough manpower. Stalin issues a decree that uh, you can be released from jail if you go and fight in the Red Army. Mm. In the meantime, before they've done that, the, the, the Vor, the, the Russian Mafia, these guys back then, had written a list of um, like laws that they live by called the Understandings. Um, and I can explain those to you. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I won't read them all. but Wait, so, so let me just clarify. Yeah. The Understandings, this like sort of Ten Commandments but not ten, it's... Something that was put together before or after the war? Before. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, that's a great way of saying it, actually, the Ten Commandments. Um, so the book is based on a, a training package I wrote for the British police after I worked in Russia. And I used to tell them like, the understandings. And when I'd tell them about the first one, all the cops would nod their heads. Uh, because the first one is a thief. A Russian criminal must show no emotion. And, you know, I'm sure you guys know, when you're dealing with these sort of Gopnik Russian hooligans, part of their thing is to be very neutral and to be emotionless, and that, that was sort of their, their main commandment. No, no emotions, no relatives, no marriage, no property, uh, no children. The Vord, the thieves of your family now, never have a proper job, never work for the government, never assist the police, all things like that. There was the, the thieves' council, like the, the ruling group of the Mafia was set up, and you had to do what they said, never question it, never gamble without being able to cover your losses, never get so drunk you can't control yourself. Learn the criminal language, fenya, like a criminal slang. All, all that was all part of the understandings. If, if there's like such thing as a um, true war, mm-hmm. a true thief, it's somebody who follows these commandments. It's someone that can be identified by this 
ID system of tattoos. Yeah, so I'm curious about the relationship between this, again, back to the tattoos, like the relationship between the symbolic tattoos and the true criminal status now. Like, is it possible to, is, does that still work? Does that system, is that system still in place? Or is that sort of something that, like, existed in the heyday around mid-century or during the late Soviet era even, and then now is like... Uh, so, the heyday of the war was uh, back in those days, and the uh, Second World War starts, Stalin offers a deal for everyone. You can be released from the gulags if you serve in the Red Army, and uh, your sentence will be cut. Not, com- not completely stopped, but your sentence will be cut. Half the guys went in the gulags, and at this time there's about two million men in the gulags, so about a million went, a million stayed. The ones who stayed then ramped it up and started to really cover themselves in tattoos. They started to really enforce the understandings. Mm. And they, they viewed that the guys who went to war were traitors and that they'd broken the understandings. One of them, which is never have a job, never work for the government, never associate with the government. War ends. Uh, Stalin didn't send these guys back. That's a myth. He, there's a myth going that Stalin sent all the guys back to the girl. He didn't. But the natural course of events, these guys ended up in prison again. And the thing called the Bitch Wars started that lasted right up until the 1970s where the former soldiers were fighting with the, the real Vor. And that's when this massive tattooing thing started. Back then, the common tattoos that you get, there are lots now and I'll, I'll tell you about them, but the ones back then, similar to what you get now, similar to sailor tattoos, daggers to show that you'd stab someone, uh, skulls to show that you committed a murder. Uh, and all those exist now. The, the big Vor tattoo is the stars on the shoulders. A bit like in the, in the Sicilian Mafia that we're familiar with. If, you've got, if you're a Don, if you're a Mafia Don, you might get an eight-point star on your sh- underneath your shoulder blades. And that shows that you're, you're high up. If, if you progress to the top level, which allegedly there are about 200 guys in the world who have, you'll, have a, you'll turn that into a 16-point star. And that shows that you are the peak of not just Russian organised crime, but the world's organised crime. Um, they also get these tattoos on their knees, which, mm-hmm. which I have come across in my, in my police career. I met a few guys who had the... Never 16, but a few eight-point stars. And, and for the most part, has that to modern day stayed um, like authentic? Or I assume that in a lot of ways, this kind of Russian tattoo aesthetic has been co-opted by pop culture. Yeah. Um, so you can tell... I, I've got uh, one example in the book and one example I do in my talk of a, a, of a faker, a guy who's got the Russian criminal tattoos, but he, he was far too young to have the ones he should have... He, the one he had on his body, and that they were done professionally. So you can tell the difference between prison ones and real ones. Mm-hmm. The guys in... The, there's a big thing now with uh, in Russian youth custody, the young teenage boys in prison tattoo themselves, cover themselves in these war tattoos that obviously they haven't earned, that they don't deserve. And sort of by the 90s, the understandings and that the, the strict rules that governed it really went out the window. Mm-hmm. You know, the, these young guys sort of idolised these older thieves, copying them. And in the past, they'd have been punished severely for that. But now it's sort of, well, you know, what can we do? Can you, could you pick like maybe uh, two other tattoos that maybe you particularly like or mean a very specific thing and just talk about those? Yeah, well, I can, I, uh, I'll give you some examples of um, first time I ever encountered it in the UK. This was one of the best times. Uh, got a call, uh, Russian speaker, he covered himself in petrol, was holding a lighter and was going to set himself on fire. So I get down there, the guy couldn't speak any English, start talking to him, talk him down from torturing himself, take him away. And obviously he changed his clothes because he's covered in petrol. See his body and he's covered in these Russian prison tattoos and chatting away to him in Russian. So, you know, oh, what does that one mean? What does that one mean? So he had, one of them he had was a, a cat, smiley cat's face with keys underneath. And he tells me that means I'm a burglar. You know, and I, he starts telling me about his uh, burgling career back in uh, Latvia. <laughs> so, oh, you know, that's quite interesting. And then he, he showed me around his neck, he's got barbed wire with spikes and he says, that was for a life sentence. Uh, each spike is a year that I served. Again, very interesting. Uh, he had a, the, the, the most common one you meet on all Russian criminals is, is the Russian church the kupa, uh, with the cupola, the, with the towers. And each tower represents either a year served or a term of imprisonment. So you can count the terms. And if they've got a cross on top of the tower, that means they served the full term. Basically, you can look at these guys and you can read what tattoos they've got. And you can say, you know, he's done this crime. He's served here. He's been in prison this many years. So it's, you know, it's really useful for, for cops as well as guys in prison. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that kind of iconography. You mentioned that this image of the church is used to indicate like certain 
sentences that people have served. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, what is the relationship between Russian speaking organized crime and the Orthodox Church? Yeah, so this is, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, <laughs> Because uh, anyone who uh, knows about Russia knows that the Russian church, they're a very political, they, 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 they've got no qualms in uh, sticking their oar in politically. They're very much involved in the state now, and they uh, were even more so back before the revolution. You know, they, they were an arm of the Tsar, in my opinion. They were very repressive to Russian society. They were very much against any sort of progress. So anyone with any sort of uh, understanding of them will see why Lenin wanted to round them up and close them all down, basically. So, as I say, the Bolsheviks are the ones who locked up all the criminals after the revolution, and the church were a big opposition to the Bolsheviks. So the criminals sort of adopted Russian iconography. Uh, the church, as I say, is, is one of the most common ones. Jesus and Mary is a very common one, you see. That means I was born in prison or born into a criminal lifestyle. Um, and Jesus has been adopted as the king of thieves by by, uh, <laughs> board, by the criminals. Wow. So it's, okay. um, you get... You, I've never encountered a Russian criminal who hasn't got some sort of religious iconography tattooed on him. So so the religious iconography doesn't necessarily translate to like, oh, I'm practicing Eastern Eastern Orthodoxy. It's, it's really more of a symbol. Well, uh, yes and no. You see, all the high up vord, all the, the, the rich Russian mafia, the oligarchs who made their money out of crime are all very much into religion. Um, and in the, uh, the guys I've met, they've always got, although it's, it's not even Orthodox, they love playing around with the rosary beads. That's a big thing that I'm a mafia guy and they've got rosary beads. They always have a cross. Uh, the bigger and more gold the cross is, the better to show your wealth. So there, there is a link between organised crime and the Orthodox Church. All Orthodox, sorry, all Russian mafia criminals are into the church. And there's, there's, there's a great documentary you can find online about, about these guys. That, you know, they all love paying for a new church to be built, donating <laughs> money to the church. That's a real big thing of theirs. I mean, you, have you been to Russian churches much? Yeah. I've been to the cathedrals, like in St. Petersburg. And you see the gold and the money there. And oh, yeah. I mean, ornate. I, yeah, ornate is, you know, is putting it mildly. I, the, the, the first, when I first uh, was visiting here a few years ago, I got taken to a service, and you see these big fat priests covered in you know, their big gold crosses. Uh, all the congregation were poor, older women, and they passed the plate around three times asking for money. And it's just, and, you know, you're in this gold church covered in... I don't think this is what Jesus really wanted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is with your little shop in the corner selling overpriced candles, and yeah. um, so uh, you know, I, 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 I know there's a law here you're not allowed to uh, offend religious believers, but uh, <laughs> the, the Russian Orthodox Church and organised crime go hand in hand, in my book. Huh. Um, but yeah, anything I can slag off the Russian Orthodox Church, I'm more than up for it because I think they're absolute scumbags. Uh, if you go to the Russian service, you can't even sit down, and it lasts for hours. That's part of it. You have to suffer and stand. You do suffer. And uh, I said, the one I got taken to, three hour, it was almost three hours. They passed the plate around three times. Um, and they're just, you know, chanting like idiots. Uh, they don't know what. And, the, and I, I thought, this, is, this, this isn't right. It's funny how, like, the story of the origin of the church is that, what was it, Vladimir, the czar back in the, like, first whatever, 900 or something, was, like, searching for religions for Russia and, like, looked at all, you know, took, took a look at all the different world religions and was like, I like, I like the Eastern Orthodox, or actually, I guess it was, like, sort of the Ottoman, Greek, Greek Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church, because it's, like, the most ornate and the most, like, elaborate and the most, it's like, this is, a, I like the way this looks. That, well, That's not gold. One of the reasons I'm into Russia was I had a history teacher at school who was obsessed with Russia, and he'd go on about it all the time. And I, he, was, he was a brilliant teacher, he was very charismatic, and he said that the reason they're orthodox is that, yeah, Vladimir went to some, he went searching for the religion that he was going to choose for Russia. And uh, he went to the, the Greeks or whoever, and they said, well, this is our religion. They presented it to him and said, and you can be the boss of it. You can be in charge. And so he said, all oh, right, I'll have that one then. So whether that's true or not, I don't know. <laughs> well, that seems like a very good one to me. Plus, the churches are pretty. But have, um, you, have you seen the, the famous picture of Partridge Kirill with his watch? Oh. Um... There, there's a famous picture on the internet. The, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, Kirill, is, is, his watch is reflecting on the table, but his watch has been photoshopped out, and it's a $30,000 oh, Philip Patek or Rolex. <laughs> yeah. The guy drives around Moscow in a, May, in a chauffeur-driven Maybach. You know, he's got a $30,000 watch on, and he's talking to people about poverty. And Also, isn't there, a, like, a pretty 
I don't know, we, I haven't researched this, but I thought there was a pretty sort of like well-documented connection between the church and the KGB and like officers being, I mean, during the Soviet era, sort of like doing some underground undercover work. I mean, there, may, there probably was. I, 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 that I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, couldn't claim to be an expert on that. I know now that it's incredibly fashionable to be a supporter of the church and you see all these Russian politicians paying homage to them. Whether, whether they believe it or not, I don't mm-hmm. know. But yeah. I, I think they're a disgraceful organisation. <laughs> okay, wait, so... So, yeah, sorry to gone off track a bit. <laughs> no, that's cool. So the connection with the Orthodox Church, yeah, I was really curious about that because you also have, like, that was something that was happening during the Soviet era as well, right? Yeah, it started, it started at the very beginning of the, yeah, the Soviet era and, and it's continued on to this day. Because, because, generally speaking, the Vori are not particularly Soviet. So they don't, because they're not, like they don't agree with the government, so it's not like they would be atheist or something. They're not, you know... No, no, it, it's... it's the, Vo- the Vori, originally, they adopted sort of two strands, as well as the traditional sort of uh, sailor tattoos. They went down the lines of taking on the orthodox stuff because it was in opposition to the Soviets. And then after the war, um, they, it became very, very common to get Nazi or German stuff. Mm. Now, every... I'd well, say every, I'm exaggerating there. I'd say 80% of the Russian criminal guys I've met have some sort of Nazi or German tattoo. because, But it doesn't mean that they're racist or a Nazi. It's more of a, a fuck you to society because they know it offends and it's very anti-Russian. Wow. Do you, do you know anything about the practice of like Russian prison tattoos in America? Like after a lot of people immigrated to, you mentioned Brighton Beach in, in your book. Do you know if, if the, that like style of tattooing became a practice within American prisons and if it changed at all? Do you know anything about I, that? I don't know about American prisons. Uh, what I do know is that the, the Russian mobs in America do maintain links with Russia. There are strong Russian Mafia presences in Chicago, New York, Miami, uh, everywhere you'd expect them, really. Yeah, Brighton Beach is the centre of it. In, in the late 70s, Russian guys went over to establish it, and then in the 90s it was sort of reinforced, and that's when they really took off. Whether they tattoo themselves in American prisons, that I don't know. I, I can't be honest. I don't say, but they, there's a thing called the Obshak, which is like a, a general fund that all the Mafia groups and the Russian criminals pay into. And the ones in America do contribute to that, and they do... They do maintain links with mm-hmm. Russia. They make they exchange manpower back and forth between Russia and America. Would that still exist? That fund? Oh, very much so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in America, they really take. They really. Um, they're really successful in America. They do. They they sort of act as sort of consultants for other criminal groups. They do like money laundering is a big thing for them. Medical insurance fraud in America is a huge thing for them. They control any sort of white collar, real sort of extreme white collar stuff. They control boiler room frauds. Uh, you know. It's, False, you know, like in, you've all seen the Wolf of Wall Street. Mm. That's what that was one of their big things that they did. Um, so yeah, they're very very active in America, supplying stuff to the. I'm sure you've all heard about this. Sub, they they got a submarine was found in. This was actually America. It was in Colombia, but a, a, a Soviet era submarine was found in the jungle, half constructed, that the Russians had supplied to the you know the narco traffickers. So yeah, they're very very active in the in the US and and in all the Americas. Do you have a question, sir? Uh. Oh yes, I did have a question. Sorry, I know. Me too. Oh, oh, you had, you had alluded to the bitch wars. Can mm. you like summarize what that was and and yeah, kind of how it resolved? And then... yes, so the bitch wars was uh, say after the war, all the guys who'd served in the Red Army against the Germans got sent back to jail. Eventually, you know, not not, not there wasn't a mass betrayal of them, but they fell into a criminal life. The economy was shot, so they got involved in crime. Went back to jail. Uh, the Vor went to take their revenge. You know, wanted to, to execute these guys. But these guys, you know, they weren't any, they weren't pushovers. They stood up and fought back. And a thing emerged called the bitch wars, where you had the uh, people who were willing to associate and to follow the rules of the prison, mostly ex-soldiers, fighting against the the, the nasty ashy vor, the original vors. So, that, so this bitch war started. The Soviets had to have two separate prisons uh, within the gulags, much like you get in the US now, where pr- prisoners are segregated by their race and by their groups to stop serious crime, you know, stop serious assaults on each other. That emerged. Lasted, you know, right up until the seventies, and the the war actually lost. They were almost wiped out in the bitch wars, and uh, this this phrase called to kiss the knife, which was a, a ritual they had where you sort of a- agreed to follow the rules of the prison, emerged. So if you if you were war to save your life, you'd kiss the knife and agree to follow the rules. So right up until the seventies, the war almost done for. And and it's from, but it's from the the war like prison wars 
from which the Russian mafia emerged, or was it a combination of them and the people that had reached? had served in the Red Army. You're asking, Smith, if the Russian mafia itself emerged sort of like after that? Yeah, from... well, what happened was, so so the Russian mafia was almost wiped out, almost wiped out, almost gone. And Khrushchev said uh, uh, soon he'll present the last criminal to, to the Soviet people. It was, you know, the Soviet, sorry, the Soviets were doing so well against uh, organised crime. Then you had the stagnation under Brezhnev where the economy went downhill and you started to get this corruption uh, within the Soviet economy, the black market emerged. And that's when the Russian mafia sort of re-emerged in its new form with these uh, very intelligent guys trading, uh, acting as go-betweens between ordinary people and the government. And, and it sort of re-emerged then. And then the 90s happened. The country fell to pieces. And that's when the, it exploded, really. It was a perfect combination of things to, to reignite the Russian mafia. And and what was, like, the difference? Because... Prior, like maybe in the earlier 20th century, the type of crime that was being committed was different than in, in the 90s, right? So in the 20s, when it emerged and it started, it was robberies, bank robberies, things like Stalin himself used to do bank robberies, I'm sure you know. You know, unusual criminal activity. Then in the 70s, you had the uh, bribery, corruption. The black market was a, a big thing. And that's when the, sort of, the Georgian groups emerged, became very powerful, dealing with the black market. Because that was against the understandings, you know, to deal with the to deal with the government, and obviously everything was the government because it was Soviet times. So you had this black marketeering right up uh, the eighties. Gorbachev instigates these laws. The biggest mistake you can make, he makes um, like you had in America in the Chicago. What's it, uh, what's the word? Prohibition. Prohibition. Yeah. So Gorbachev introduced the dry laws. Not quite prohibition, but you can only buy two bottles of vodka a month. <laughs> um, so that that created this huge prohibition type. Bonanza for organised crime, economy stagnating worse and worse and worse. Gorbachev makes um, allows people to. This was the, the the biggest mistake he made was the, the two things. The dry laws was a, a huge mistake. The other one was allowing people to trade and set up cooperatives. So all these cooperatives did was purchase things from the government and then sell them on the black market. Sell them on the, so the government. You all know Soviet shops are empty anyway. So the stuff that was made by the the Soviet factories wasn't getting to the shops anyway. Gorbachev institutes this law. So the stuff that was made, being made and not getting to the shops, it got even worse. These guys were either stealing it or mostly through blackmail and bribery, getting it from the factories and selling it for 10 times its value on the, on the streets. And that meant you know, no, no extra stuff was being made, just more was being stolen and sold at a much higher price. So that combined with the dry laws, combined with the stagnation of the economy, combined with oil price crash, the Soviets were really dependent on oil money back then, Chernobyl, every, everything that could have gone wrong for Gorbachev did go wrong. And he basically crashed the economy. And that got organised crime going again. 90s happened, police unpaid for months and months. Average salary of less than $100 a month, hyperinflation at 1,000%, uh, poverty rates at 51%. It, it's the perfect storm for organised crime to flourish. And that's what happened. Okay, so can you talk about um, the relationship between like the Russian oligarchs emerging in the 90s and organised crime? Like, Is this one and the same group of people? Is this... Yes, it is. Um, Russia's first billionaire, Boris Berezovsky, I'm sure a lot of you know this guy, fled to the West in the early 2000s, as did many of the oligarchs. He presented himself in the West, in the UK, as a champion of democracy, as an anti-Putin freedom fighter. Uh, but the guy, yeah, he was Russia's first billionaire uh, by fraud. He, he defrauded millions of people. Uh, the way they did it, 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 was a, it was a very simple scheme. This thing called uh, shock therapy was forced on Russia uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where... They had to privatise the economy very quickly and get everything into private hands. So the idea sounds good. Everyone was given a check, a privatisation check, that they could cash in for shares. Ordinary people, they've been living in the Soviet Union for 70 years, they don't know anything about share ownership. Um, they're starving, they've got no work, and they've got they've been given this check. The average check was sold for, I believe, about $7. Uh, people I've interviewed say so they, they swapped their check for a bottle of vodka, or for you know, some food because they were starving. And guys like Berezovsky swept up these checks. Now, a number of people were smart enough not to hold on to them, and they invested them in these schemes that were set up all around the country. The most famous one was called AAA, where people could invest their, their, their check and it would be put into a fund. Every single one of those investment funds went bankrupt, every single one. Mm. Um, so the checks were then dished out at secret auctions to the oligarchs to buy up for pennies. People who were clever enough to hold on to their checks or to buy other checks and to invest them were murdered or had their property stolen off them at gunpoint. So 
men like Berezovsky. I won't mention other oligarchs because Berezovsky's dead, so we can say what we like about him. He can't sue us. <laughs> but other oligarchs made their fortune by getting hold of these checks, buying up oil company. Oh, a famous one. One of the I won't say the name of it. One of the most famous Russian state utilities that is worth trillions of dollars uh, was auctioned off at, at, uh, in a village in Siberia, and only residents of that village were allowed to bid. Now, luckily, a number of super rich oligarchs had registered themselves in that village just before the auction. So they were able to snap up uh, a huge state utility for a fraction. I mean, I'm, I'm talking a couple of percent of its true value. Mm. So that, that's how these guys, you know, got their money. You don't, you don't make a billion dollars, honestly, overnight. So th- there is a huge... And it's, in, it's, it's, it's uh, almost... It's a hugely... Uh, annoys me in the West the way you see these gangsters presenting themselves as these great guys who are into into liberalism and, uh, you know, oh, I want to help poor Russia and I'm a de- Democrat. When, you, you know, you, you st- you've made your billion dollars by stealing it off people. I mean, I, I was aware of that, like, general phenomenon a little bit, but I didn't realise the kind of very specific relationship between the UK and yeah. Russian oligarchs. Could you detail that a little bit? Yeah, the UK. So uh, this isn't just, this is, this is fact. I mean, Forbes magazine said the UK is, is home to a money laundering network, you know, like the Cayman Islands. London channels money in. Now, uh, the UK, is, they've chosen London, specifically London, as a place to run to. Because uh, as, as a UK police, I can tell you, we've never extradited a single Russian criminal. Not one. So if you're, if you're a Russian bad guy, you can go to the UK, you're safe. Uh, there's a thing in the UK called the UK Investment Visa Scheme, where we will give you a visa slash passport, almost no questions asked. The only question is, how much money have you got? Uh, if you've got... I, right, I think it's still the same as this. If you got, if you invest two million pounds, if you invest two million pounds in the UK, uh, not in things like properties, but other things in shares or government bonds specifically, you can have a visa, no questions asked. Uh, after five years of having that visa, you're given a British passport, and having a British passport, then you, you definitely won't be extradited to Russia. If you invest ten million pounds uh, in two years, you can have the British passport in two years. So this was the, the chosen thing for the Russian guys to do. Fly, uh, flee to the UK, present yourself as a Democrat, you get, you get your passport, you're, you will not be extradited. London's very, you know, it's convenient for, for working. You, you know, you can be in New York within, is it five hour flight to New York from London? You mm-hmm. can be in Moscow in three and a half hours, you can do business all around the world, you're right in the middle. The Russians love British education system, they love British culture. It, it became the destination choice for all the Russian oligarchs fleeing, fleeing in the 2000s to go to. Is there a known living mafia head right now from the Russian speaking world? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a few, there's a few. Um, I think I feel yeah, can you So so the Russian Russian mafia is not a huge one group organization. It's many sort of separate groups linked together. You've got the biggest one is a group in Moscow, uh Solzhenitsyn Bratstva or something I can't remember. That's got 5000 members. I can't remember the lead the headman's name off the top of my head, but he's uh, still Free. Simeon Moglievich is uh, the FBI called the, the, the boss of bosses and the world's most powerful mobster. He's a Ukrainian Israeli uh, mafia boss who is Rome's free. I believe he's, he lives in Moscow. He's, he's, he's number four on the FBI's world's most wanted list. Um, so yeah, he's, he's roaming about. Uh, <laughs> took a tune of another one, the one who I think you girls are a bit young for this, but uh, when you had the Salt Lake City Winter Olympics, he was the guy who bribed a load of judges for Russia to win a gold medal and he was he was a big mafia figure in Germany and France and Italy who's back again back in Russia now mm. there's, there's loads of them there's, there's guys in the south of France uh, you've got all the guys who are wanted and famous in the UK the Chechen warlords live in the UK I, I say I won't name them because I don't want to get anyone in trouble but they're in my book actually if you want <laughs> <laughs> by the book yeah, apart from Budazovsky who was uh, who's dead so we can say what we like you know, they're, they're, yeah, there's loads. There's loads and loads of them roaming free. This question of, like, back to what is a true war, what is this thief, how are these, like, contemporary mafia bosses related to the war? Because presumably they kind of work in some way, right? Like, through channels that maybe don't fit in with the understanding. So I'm just curious, yeah. What's the relationship there? Well, I wouldn't say work. If you act in a criminal way, it isn't work. So they, they don't count that as work. Um, I mean, yeah, the Vord now, one of the reasons they're so successful is that it's very difficult for, to infiltrate them by the police because you, they, they get these tattoos in prison. You have to be answered for, oh, I served 
with this guy in prison. I, I did, you know, Russians, you know, they say that I sat in prison yeah. with this guy for so many years. And you tattoo yourselves and that shows who you are. And to get your tattoos, you have to, you have to get it approved by your cellmates, by, if it's a, if it's a high ranking tattoo that you'd like, like the stars, or let's, let's say, um, Lily, let's say a little scenario. So I, I'm a mafia chief and I order you to go and commit a murder for me. High ranking guy, you, you do that murder. Mm-hmm. Right, well done. You end up in prison. You can say, I, I did that murder for Mark in Moscow. I killed that guy. Yes, you, yes, you did. Da, da, da. So you're, you can award yourself or you get awarded this tattoo. Let's say high ranking. Anything on the shoulders is traditionally high ranking. So, and it's a murder you've committed. So you might get a huge dagger going from one shoulder blade into your neck coming out the other side. That shows you've committed a high ranking murder. Um, you might get some drips of blood off it for other, to show the other murders you've committed. <laughs> you might have killed someone not so high for me. And you can have yourself a skull uh, or a grave, maybe on your ribs, on your abdomen. And it still exists today. It, it absolutely exists. It's not as strictly controlled, but the guys see the understandings as an ideal, not a cast iron law. They try to follow it, which is why cops will say, if they deal with Russian guys, they're very, they, people are oh, they're ignorant, but they just, they sort of just don't speak to you. They just, mm, you know, and da, nyet, da, nyet, and they show no emotion. Um, when I used to interview the guys back in prison in the UK, they, they, they changed because they were a bit shocked that I could speak Russian. Uh, I'd take them out of the jail for a McDonald's or for a cigarette or you know, anything I could do for them. And because I was interested in the tattoos, they, they, they were quite happy to show me. And I, I think a lot of them understood that. In the UK, we've got a big problem with Eastern European drunks and hooligans and you know, bums, basically. And they get treated like that. And I think by showing me that, oh, no, you know, I was Russian mafia, I did this, I did that, that they would get a lot more respect from the English jail workers, the English cops, which is true. So they were very keen to show me. But they do, you know, this stuff, although it's not, an, it's not cast ironly followed, it's, it's seen as an ideal. And they do try and follow it. Wait, sorry, was this, you can take uh, people out of, out of English prisons or out of Russian prisons just to, like, go out and about? No, no. Well, I was a, I was a police officer in England, so I, I you know, I could do that. I, what, what we do in England, I'm sure they do it in America as well, is uh, intelligence interviews. So, if you've got a gang member or someone who might have something, you know, that you want to know about, you'll go and do an intelligence interview with them. That doesn't have to be done in prison. You know, you can. You, in, people aren't going to tell you something for nothing. You know, if you. Right. Uh, and a McDonald's and a cigarette is is quite a, is worth quite a lot for someone who's locked up. I'm uh, curious about these practices in women's prisons because I know that women would also get prison tattoos and I'm wondering is it the same set of rules or was there variation and could women be like a true boy so no uh, no sorry so I know this doesn't uh, I know your American (laughs) feminists might kick off now and uh, but but no no you can't be you can't be in the Russian mafia so sadly Uh, but women in Russian prisons do tattoo themselves quite heavily uh, it takes a compl- it takes a different line. I mean, they're quite similar designs. They've got the same greeny, bluey, you know, they're not very attractive, but they're more sentimental and they might show, similar to the men, why the woman's in jail. I'm sure you'll do this now. I know Lily will start doing this. You can, on the metro, you can look at people and you look at their hands and you can spot the prison tattoos. A uh, common one you see on Russian women is the sign that they used to be a prostitute, which would be a, a lily, a flower, oh. an open flower with a coin. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> So that's the... Um, oh, well. uh, on their hand? No, not on the hand. On the women, it's normally around the hips, the groin, mm-hmm. around the sexual areas. Hard to see on the metro, but... <laughs> uh, but you might get a swan, which uh, is a sign of lost virginity. Uh, that could be on the hands. Um, you, you get uh, a lot of... Uh, yeah, sort of open flat... Uh, a violin shows uh, a lesbian. Um, uh, I think a, an apple with a bite out of it shows lost virginity as well. There's lots of... Lots of they're more sexual and sentimental is the way I describe it in the book. You get lots of like names of children, names of lost lovers against the man who's the reason they're inside. But you also this is the interesting thing about the women. You get the, the most horrific punishment tattoos are done by the uh, by the women prisoners on each other. And I've not seen this. I've only heard about it. A Russian cop told me that the worst he's seen was I know I can be a bit crude on your show uh, was a, an erect penis going into a woman's mouth tattooed on her face, and that was because oh, she killed her own children. Oh, that's fucked. Oh, that's rough. That's rough, but that's also I when I read that in the book, I was just like it kind of struck me as like, I mean, it's it's interesting that that's the choice for 
what is that called when you, when you kill your own children? Is there like mattress? A no, it's killing your mother matricide, isn't it? Matricide. Yeah, whatever. Something uh, side. Yeah. Detty side. Detty side. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. Russianize it. Yeah, it's well because it's women using male sexual violence against other. Yeah, women that's super. I mean, it's male symbolic male sexual violence for killing for like something that is sort of like this, you know, perceived as like this horrifically unnatural thing or just like there's a lot going on there yeah. symbolically yeah. and it's interesting that that's the choice of punishment it's horrible but yeah it is horrible i'm curious kind of about your methodology for collecting photos and interviewing people for the book mm -hmm. like uh, can you can you just talk about that like your experience of going into prisons and talking to people and stuff? so, so what